twice. This year was probably our most difficult build um, from an engineering standpoint, a design standpoint, from a teamwork standpoint, um, and also from a competition standpoint. Um, at our regional competition, which was the weekend before spring break down at Cal U, we ended up finishing 32nd out of 54 teams down there, um, which really isn't indicative of our robot. This is probably the best um, robot that we've built and it was able to do every single thing in the challenge this year which was a first for us also usually we would pick one element of it and I'll show you those in a second um, but it's interesting because uh, I was explaining to some people we get put in alliances there's six teams that compete on the field at the same time we're one of those teams two of them are partnered with us the other three are opposing us and it gets switched up and it's randomized throughout and this year, our draw of Alliance Partners was pretty thin. Um, in fact, and here's a good idea of what FIRST is about. We, we showed up at competition, and um, the team next to us was a rookie team from Ohio. Um, there were five members there from their team and, and a couple mentors. That was it. It's a brand new team, but they showed up with a drive base and nothing else. They're in one of the first matches with us on our alliance. We all looked at each other and said, we need to help them. So our team went and helped build a robot that they could compete with in their first match with us, but then went on, uh, we, when we came back to school Friday night, we collected some um, hex shaft and some other parts that they could use, and then we went back with them with some design ideas and helped them on Saturday, and by the end of competition, they had a pretty good robot that they were competing with. So. Um, you know, and they may have been on some of the alliances that eventually beat us, we don't know. I mean, it's randomized. But the idea is that you're helping people be successful there and, and learn. So that's really what FIRST is about. It was nice to see that this year. Good job. Um, thanks. I think that um, uh, I'll let some of these guys talk about the design things, but <coughs> just to fill you in, we have six weeks. It started January 7th was our kickoff. We have six weeks from that date to build a robot to compete in competition. At the end of six weeks, you have to lock it up and can't touch it until you get to competition again. We were four weeks into competition and all we had was a drive base for a robot. None of the top part of that robot existed. We didn't even have ideas of what it was going to look like at that point, which from our design standpoint was probably our most difficult uh, part of this season was we're already four weeks in, we have two weeks, weeks left, and we can't decide as a group how to make that work and what we want it to look like. There was a lot of ideas floating around, but there was no consensus, uh, nothing. And I'll let the kids talk you through the process they went through where everything on a Saturday morning, we had uh, a meeting of minds and said, look, this, we put up a slide that said, what, 28 days left, right? And um, you have to be done. And they all looked at that and said, oh my gosh, 28 days. And we went through a process, and they'll talk to you about the process of how they got to where they are and 
and how they made this all work. Um, once they're done talking to you, um, I'll show this year's game animation for you. It's a two minute video that shows what the game is about. I'm going to show you a quick video of one of our matches so you get to see our robot actually in competition. Our field elements this year, the pieces that we have to play with, are um, 12 feet long, 5 feet wide, 9 feet high. They, it was too much to bring here to demonstrate all that stuff to you. At, um, we did have it at the uh, Celebrate CV. We set that all up in the middle school gym there for people to see. But um, So we'll just do quick things here. But I did want to show you one of our actual matches so you can see what it's like with six robots on the field and how that works. So the way our team is built is um, every, every, we split up the work and there's a design team. Where, where's Dylan? You guys stand up and be. Yeah, you guys that work on the design team. I have a programming team. Public relations. Okay, and there's, a, there's some people that aren't here that, but uh, we're responsible for all that kind of stuff. We have a build team. We have a pit design team. So these people are responsible for that particular <coughs> aspect of the robot. And I'm going to let each of those kind of tell you what they do, what their role is. And their role is really not just to make sure that robot works. Their role is to make sure that I have somebody next year on the team that can do what they do. Um, because there's no way that us as mentors can know every aspect of everything that's going on. We have a lot, a lot of people that have some good backgrounds, machining backgrounds, maybe some programming or electrical engineering backgrounds, but they're all specialized. And we talk amongst ourselves, um, the kids have to teach somebody else. Over the last two years, I've lost 34 seniors from the team. We've started with 12, we have 40 members now. Um, I have a really young team this year. Um, so over the past few years, we've had seniors mentor the younger kids and bring them up through, and that's what these kids are doing now with the younger members on the team. So, um, Claire, you want to talk about build and talk, talk them through our prototypes? So, I'm currently learning from an older student, Ryan Crown. He's my mentor, and I'm going to take over build team next year. So, the build team is really responsible for the structure of the robot and the like, the lift there and the actual structure of the robot. We don't do really the brains of it or like the wiring, the programming, because that's all Jack and them. We do the actual structure. So, I built the chassis this year. And then we had Mr. DeLong help us with the lift, and Crown, Ryan Crown, built most of the um, intake that you can see over there. Pitch grades 9 through 12? Yeah. So we had a lot to decide this year, because this game, you there was so much to decide, and it was a completely new beast for us. Usually the games are put, how many pieces can you get in some kind of thing as fast as possible? Like last year, we were just putting gears on a peg. We were very good at this. But this year, we had to move these blocks on different levels and be able to hold control of something. So we needed speed, accuracy, and pretty much being able to do everything. You couldn't specialize in one thing in this game. So our intake was probably the hardest part to design. We had no idea how to do it. There were so many different designs. So first, we went through like this kind of design that like went like this. But we kind of decided against it because it wasn't very accurate and like we didn't have wheels to pull it in at the time. But eventually, I think Ryan Crown went online and found some kind of other design the team did and got him thinking and he worked with Dylan to draw it up in CAD and see how it works. And eventually he made this wood model of it. It would work perfectly. We actually attached drills to wheels to test it and had it moving in and out. And then eventually we cut it out of polycarbonate because we, a weight was a really big problem for us this year. It's all aluminum. So that caused a lot of weight, and we had to be under 120 pounds. So this polycarbonate, which um, my friend kind of knew a guy who actually had it. So this polycarbonate is, yeah, he knew a guy who had it. That was good. So this polycarbonate is about half the weight of aluminum, at least, but it's about the same strength, and it's very flexible, so it's easier to work with for us. We tried laser cutting it, but it looked kind of bad because it looked burnt on the edges. So we had seen and seed it in the shape, and we have we made multiples of this exact design, and they are all exactly the same. So if that one did manage to break competition, which was a real problem, because we didn't know how defense was going to be played yet, because that's not something you really understand until you're there. We had I think six other arms, mm -hmm. six arms and one other intake just in case that we and we already had it set up at the churro, so we just had to move the hardware in real quick and. 
So that was most of our design. And then our lift was very hard to choose because it had to be strong enough to hold up that whole thing over there. The pneumatics, the lift itself, wheels, motors, everything had a lift. So that was very hard. And then the scale, which is the taller one you have to put the blocks on, goes down and up. So we had to decide whether we wanted to go under and like have a three-stage lift or not go under and have a two-stage lift. The problem with the three-stage lift was a lot heavier, but it gave us more versatility because we could get around people easier and things and go under the scale. But the two-stage two lift was a lot taller but a lot lighter. We eventually chose the three-stage lift because we wanted to be able to move around more in the field and, be, and so if defense was a problem, we could get around and it would be easier for us. So we actually did a whole decision matrix on things like this. Which, for those of you who don't know, it's you have different topics and you rate each one on importance and add it up at the end. So each one of the highest, I think the highest number is most important and the lowest number is least important. So we made a Google form and sent it out to the whole team. <coughs> so we had everyone's data on what we thought was most important. Now this was a this was at the beginning of the week. This is the beginning of the season. But we didn't use this information until about the end because we spent four weeks designing. Then we eventually got a design thanks to Dylan and his CAD team drawing everything. And we built that all in about two weeks. The wiring team had two days, and they were very mad at us about that. Because <laughs> we kept just taking up more and more space, because this robot, it, it needed a lot of support in places. Because it's going up, you guys will see, it goes up nine feet. So we needed to be able to support it, and it, could, it couldn't be unstable. We, it couldn't get hit. So eventually, so we, we had to put this bar in, which ruined the wiring team's design. <laughs> and eventually, it did work out pretty well. But we had to drill all of these holes in here because this was 46 pounds, I think. Mm -hmm. So we had to be under 120. So we had to drill all of these holes, and we actually have holes in every corner that we call our taillights and headlights because we needed to get rid of any weight we could. There's large holes in this bottom plate here and everything, and then we have holes cut out here to save weight. We actually learned how to CNC aluminum by doing that. We didn't know we could do that. Um, it's a large machine that like uses a drill bit to cut out from a program, so it cuts out exactly what you want, and it's how we cut out most of the things here, so you didn't have the human error of us drilling the holes, which we've had a lot in past robots. <laughs> so these holes are exact, like where we put them on the drawing of the program, that is exactly where they are. And Dylan can probably talk more about that, because he's the one that does the drawings for them to put in the holes. But that CNC makes sure everything's exact and everything's going to fit every time. Which is most important for us because we don't have time to fix everything every time. We, after designing, we had two weeks. Like, we couldn't waste time on anything. There was a few nights that we were there until about 10 o'clock. Yeah. We were building until about 10 o'clock sometimes. We came in on Sundays. We had a Monday off that we came in, too, for most of the day. So we were every day working, figuring out something new. We didn't, it was just, it's hard to explain how much time we spent because it, it does, it seems like very small, but to us it seems kind of longer than you'd expect because we spend so much time together. What <laughs> 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 class are you in? I'm a sophomore. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, it's kind, of, it's kind of funny, like, to sit back and hear them, and that's, that's fun for me to listen to them talk about it. What's really funny is that the build team used to joke to the wiring team all the time, like, you're holding us up, you're holding us up, you're holding us up. And this year, the wiring team and the programming team were done with their prototypes, their designs, had everything worked out, and the build team's holding them up. So they got to hear it all the time, you're holding us up. <laughs> then we finally finished, and they had to make adjustments, like Claire said, and they had to um, completely redo their wiring design because we took their space for the building. <laughs> So, and Claire didn't tell you, but we were at 132 pounds when we put that together. So, anybody's tried to lose 12 pounds? <laughs> <laughs> Try to lose 12 pounds on a robot, that's how it's tough. That's how it's tough. Um, bol bolts were changed out to titanium fasteners, which were 30% lighter. I mean, we went to button head screws versus socket head cap screws. I mean, and changing tiny little bolts here and there, but there's a lot of them. So, just well, kids are learning how to how do I maintain the strength and the stability, but get it to where it needs to be, so. Um, 
what I realized is probably, as Claire was talking about, she's talking about the scale and the switch and all that kind of stuff. I'm going to show you this video. This is the game animation. And they talk about the different game pieces in here, so you get to kind of see what we had to do. And uh, I'll play this for you real quick. Welcome to the 2018 First Robotics Competition and this year's game, First Power Up. Two alliances of video game characters and human operators are trapped in an arcade game. To escape, alliances use power cubes to control switches and the scale, pass power cubes through the exchange for power-ups, and ascend to face the boss. Teams may preload up to one power cube per robot. Additional power cubes are available in the power cube piles, along the fence nearest the scale, and in each alliance portal. At the start of the match, the plates of the scale and the switches are randomized. During the first 15 seconds, robots are autonomous. They work to cross their auto line and place power cubes on the switch and the scale. Alliances who successfully own their switch and have three robots cross the auto line will receive one ranking point. During the following 2 minute and 15 second teleoperated period, human operators remotely control their robots. They continue to gather power cubes to place on the scale and the switches to gain ownership for the longest time, earning points for each second of ownership. Human operators behind the Alliance Station wall collect power cubes from the exchange. They can deliver them back to the robots through the return or to their vault. In the vault, power cubes may be traded in for three power-ups. Alliances choose when in the match to activate each power-up to gain a temporary advantage during the match. The fourth power-up gives an alliance ownership of their switch, the scale, or both. The boost power-up increases scoring for 10 seconds for either their switch, the scale, or both. And near the end of the match, Levitate earns one member of the Alliance a free climb. Other Alliance members climb from their platform. If all three members successfully climb, the Alliance can face the boss and gain an additional ranking point. The Alliance that earns the most points wins the match and defeats the boss. So that's all that we saw on January 7th. And they tell you you have six weeks from then, and everyone worldwide sees it the exact same time. Um, so it's 4,400 4, FRC teams at our level across, around the world that compete. We all see that video that day at that time, and that's all that you get. And you got to build a robot from nothing to compete in that in six weeks. So um, I'm going to have uh, Dylan trainer and talk to you a little bit, just real quick about design, okay, and maybe some challenges. And Jack, do you want to talk about it? Sure. My name is Dylan Trainer. I am the unofficial head of the CAD team, also known as the design team. I work a lot in Inventor, making um, computer drafted models for all of the pieces that work, both with an end of the uh, season model that can rotate and turn for display, and for creating parts early on, like you saw I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, it's a bit of a slow starting area of the team because you need to have something to work with when you first start. But this year, we relied heavily on the de determination of the pieces when we were trying to find out um, prototypes. So it was a little more pressure on the team this year. What you saw over there are a few different um, cutouts that we first used when we were trying to determine what we should do for the intake and the arms and things like that. The way that originated was I was given a picture, the size of the cube, and an outer size, and then he said to make it. I didn't get any measurements, which is a little bit tough. I'm a little <laughs> bit, um, it was uh, definitely a struggle to overcome, but it did turn out very well in the end. We were able to get a template and use the laser cutter to cut out different things in the Lexan and the wood, and then we sort of used that physical aspect of it up to the cubes, which are sitting behind you guys, to find out if it would fit correctly, if it would work correctly, if it could be widened, if you see the only arms there, there's a um, path cut out for a churro that needed to be not connected with when the arms are moving in and out. 
And then once that stage was over, and we sort of supplied the plans for that, and they were able to make prototypes, test that, and build the actual prototypes of them, the CAD team then shifted gears to the other purpose they have, which is taking all of the parts created that are not physically ordered parts, which can be found online, thankfully. The parts that we create and modify need to be hand-drawn and extruded and created as three models that are rotatable and usable for a both display and for measuring whenever you need to find, will the robot fit under this gap in the game element? Well, we don't have a robot yet, but we have a model of it, and we can find how tall or how wide it needs to be and move it straight through. And then after all of it's been created, and is the manual over there for the mm -hmm. part of this? Yeah. After all of it has been created, we are able to create a little booklet along with a 3D model that we have on our laptop display, this one, laptop actually, while we're there in the competition, if you want to pass it around. Um, for judges, and they will look through the pamphlet and the model, and they'll go, I'll explain to you the process of how we create all the 3D rendering for all of the parts, and then, excuse me for a second, then we have the model at the end of the year that we use as sort of like the final judging panel. And that's the primary purpose of the design team. Mm -hmm. You want to open that file real quick? Sure, I can see it'll yeah. open up. If someone wants to talk while I'm loading it. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, uh, first is um, much more than just us going and building a robot. The entire purpose of it is that it stands for, for inspiration and recognition of science and technology. And they really embrace that idea. There's this program that has been going on. It will be in its fifth uh, and the fifth year this year. It's called the first first national advocacy conference, and it's teams from all around the country. They have the opportunity to go and visit Washington D.C. and advocate for some sort of STEM ideal that they think should be um, in gone into schools, such as last year, it was advocating that me and my dad went to, and we're opening it up to everybody on the team this year, if they wish to come, to advocating for um, the Every Student Succeeds Act, Title IV, Part A, which was for um, after-school mentor-based STEM programs. And by doing so, what it is, is that not enough, there wasn't enough money appropriated to this part of the bill in order to get it to go to every school so that they'd have money to fund programs like FIRST Robotics or any programs that would help kids that want to learn more about STEM. And so the problem with it is that, again, it wasn't appropriated enough money so that it had to all be put into grants. But, and since it was put into grants, the schools that needed the money didn't actually have the resources to get the money so that the like yeah the schools want to get it and um after so what we were advocating for at that conference was that more money to be appropriated to it so that every school um was it would be able to get money to fund those programs and um this year we are opening up to the entire team for anybody who wants to come you go down to washington dc for three days and the first couple days you learn about how government works, um, how you should uh, present yourselves in front of all the people in Congress, and then you go and the day on Tuesday, which is the last day, you go up to Capitol Hill and you talk to your senators and representatives asking for what they can do to help get more money to this program. <coughs> Alright, so Dylan brought up, that, that's our 3D model that was actually judged. Everything moves on that. Um, we're able to grab different parts of it and stretch it and open it up, lift, make the lift work, the intake work. Um, because the judges question, like, did, did you build this part? Did you design this part? How does it work? How does it interact with the other parts? And we're able to show that, we, you know, that's, that's all ours. That we actually do that. So they had they, a challenge had to be a challenge. Excuse me? And then it goes up high. It had to be a challenge. Yeah, you'll see it in the match. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, it gets, it get, I mean, it goes up to nine feet. It goes up pretty high. Actually, it'll stop right before it hits the ceiling in here. And it, uh, there's a couple times during matches where if they react really quick, you're like, oh my gosh, here goes. Um, and there were some robots that did tip over, but ours never did. We were able to control it pretty well. And it's a combination that there's two people that drive it, which you'll see Dylan is the main driver of the robot. He just controls it on the ground where it goes. Morgan is, the, she's called the co-pilot. She does everything else that that robot can do. She runs the intake, the wheels, the lift, um, can flip the arms up or down, depending on if somebody's gonna run into it on the field, she needs to move it up out of the way so it doesn't get hit. Um, she's responsible for it not tipping over. <laughs> she has to be able to bring it down at the right time so that when Dylan does stop or back up real quick, it doesn't go. So, um, do you wanna talk about your programming experience this year? A little bit. <clears throat> um, so this year I was the head programmer, which was really difficult because last year one of our alumni, Tommy and Debbie, he was our head programmer and a senior, so I only had one year to learn. So going into this this year was really difficult, but it was me, um, Kelsey, and Allie. They helped program. But as they were telling me before, the design, because it took four weeks, and then the wiring had two days program had like a day to test everything that they had like programmed for like weeks beforehand. And then the autonomous just shown in the game video, which was the first 15 seconds where your robot has to go by itself without any controls. We had like a few hours to do that and fix that. <laughs> so that was so all we had to do was cross the auto line. But actually in competition with programming, like we had some extra time so we were able to build upon that in our last two matches I think we were we were able to build an entire Thomas program which the lift went up we had a cube and it was able to go on our switch which had us to win the, that match um no so far oh this year we had a new mentor his name was Chris he he's actually a professor in Lavi which is able to come in and help us with with the basis of programming and how to get it to drive or like we have pneumatics in it which is um which he helped us program and Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Maury did not want to talk. <laughs> I'll read about it now. But, um, but I, th I think, and Morgan's pretty quiet about it. She said that you'll see that the, the autonomous, in our last match, we faced the number one alliance as a 30, we were ranked 35th, I think, at the time. And we faced the number one alliance and beat them. Which really goes to show what our robots could really do. But through the whole weekend, they can, the kids continue to work on the robot because while you're a competition, you can. And Morgan learned more, I think, in three days of programming than she did of six weeks in build. In the last five hours, we wrote five autonomous, or in the last hour, we wrote five autonomous programs and all of them worked. <laughs> wow. Because yeah. if you saw in the video, you know how the, the lights turned red or blue on different switches? Well, in autonomous mode, a signal was sent to your driver's station that said, you're on the right side this time is blue, or the left side is blue. So you could run on a, you don't know what autonomous program to run. So they had to write a program that would read the code from the field that would determine our robot has to go out, turn left, because red is on this side now, we, we activated red. Or if we don't activate red, what does the robot do? We can still get points if we can drive and pass the line. <coughs> so she had to write programs that would figure all that stuff out, and in the end, the, the thing that won that match was that, that she figured out how to write a program for the robot to be able to drive to that line, lift the cube, and put the cube in the switch, which were huge points in autonomous for the robot to be able to do that. There are very few teams that have anything autonomous other than driving forward across the line to get a point. And sometimes it's hard to make the robot go straight, you know? Um, and then, uh, what's that? Yeah. Um, I have that, oh. Uh, autonomous, uh, you know what, I'll, let me play that one video that shows, and you want to talk about PR real quick? Yeah. Okay, and you're, what grade are you? I'm a freshman. <coughs> so this is my first year on the PR team, and as that job, we did a lot of sponsorships looking for members to help us out with our team, and look for people who were willing to fundraise us, get our names out in the community. So we made a lot of phone calls, we talked about our team, we did websites, we did um, social media such as Instagram, Snapchat, and we were thinking about doing Chairman's next year, which is an award from the first robotics team. This is the one award we have not won yet. So we were going to try for next year, 
And basically showing that we are part of the community. We're trying to get first and stem out into the world to show that other people can do this, other people can help us, and we can help other people. We were thinking about doing a smaller league for like kids from first grade to fourth grade, calling it the Pony League, where they came in, they do Lego robotics, and they build their own little robot and we help and coach them through that. Claire, do you want to? It's actually a program at first called FLO Junior, which we are FRC, which is their top level. There's a tech challenge, FLO, and FLO Junior. So this is the introductory first, where it's about $100 to get into the competition compared to our 5000 And they, ha it's, from what I've read, I haven't read a ton into it because we are only in developing <coughs> this. But it is up to six kids on a team, and they have, there's like a problem in like the world that they try to understand it and try to figure out a way they can fix it. This year's was Aqua Adventure, so they learned about how we get our water and where it comes from. And then the Legos, they're supposed to build some way they could fix it and like make it improve it. So it's a good way for younger kids to learn about the world around them and get an understanding and also introduce engineering to them and hopefully increase our rates of, um, um, of kids joining our team throughout the years because we want them to be like in first as long as they can. First is a great program that helps get kids in engineering. It shows the fun parts of it instead of just all like doing math problems. It shows the working through it and it gets kids learning about it very, very young, which gives them a good head start that many kids don't have anymore. Thank you. Um, we should talk about our sponsors. You can see on our um, team banner, um, Bechtel is a $5,000 team sponsor. Covestro donated over $1,000 worth of polycarbonate um, in four foot by eight foot sheets for us. Um, Williams is another $5,000 sponsor of the team. Uh, Langsys, Pittsburgh Technical Institute, um, Pajarski Auto, Soho Suppliers right here in Bridgeville. Um, and then there's a, a lot of other small donors that don't actually make the poster but help, help the team go. So the robotics team is fully funded through its own. Um, so we're not part of the budget. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, much, how much is your budget? Yeah, is our cap? Uh, our budget's uh, about 38000 a year. Um, That's a good question. Do they cap it? They don't. Yeah. No. 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 The, our robot is capped. The robot has a $4,000 cap on it. And I can show you $4,000 in parts in our, in our list. It costs a lot more than that to build it. But I only have to account for what shows up on the field that day in a materials list to the judges to prove we have 4000 or less in our robot. Um, but it takes a lot more, just materials for prototyping and backup parts. And um, So honestly, there's about $10,000 sitting on the floor right there in front of you. Um, but $4,000 of it's on a materials list. And they check all that. They check your list and they check your robot to make sure everything matches up. So um, it's ex it's expensive, but I think it's well worth the investment uh, for the kids. You know, but our like I said, our budget's about thirty eight thousand dollars a year, um, and those big <coughs> sponsors really help us. If we had qualified for world championships again this year, Becca would have paid our way to go. Um, so they've been huge. Um, I talked to Eric from Bechtel this year, and he said that they're with us again for next year. So that's our goal was to, to start to work with some of them and um, kind of create that relationship so that they continue to support us and we continue to help them. <coughs> Bechtel's looking for these kids. He keeps, Eric keeps saying to these kids, remember Bechtel when you graduate. <laughs> so, I mean, they're looking for the, you know, the bright kids, the kids that really want to work hard and be able to troubleshoot and work as a team and, and all that kind of stuff. So. But um, real quick here, I'll show you uh, our, one of our, this was our next to the last match. The last match I'm proud of because we beat the number one alliance um, for a number of reasons. <laughs> but uh, this match was impressive. Um, our robot did everything that it was supposed to do in this robot. One, power up. And the power up they oh, did, the red lines moving out slowly. Yeah, we're, we're the red lines in this match. Yeah, we're robotics from the right We're trying to take possession of that switch, but they're just a little so bit All they wanted us to do in this was drive forward yeah. to get the points in our palm. Both switches and the scale are wide open at this point. And then we're point, going up with the scale right there. Trying to change that. Switch. Pick up the scale. 
64-14, picking up the switch for the Red Alliance as well. And it's 17-08. They've got a score to settle on that switch, and they ended up putting up another power cube on there as well. Blue Alliance in possession of their switch, Red Alliance in possession of the scale and the switch. Red Alliance currently picking up two points per second. Blue Alliance only pick up one point per second because they only have possession of their switch and not the scale. Red Alliance has a multi-cube advantage on the scale right now. It's a little crowded on the field. They get another point over the Blue Alliance. The Blue Alliance has plenty of time left to turn the tide and tip the scales back in their favor. But they've opened up about a 60-point deficit right now. working to try to get cubes delivered into the driver's station for the Blue Alliance. Trying to maneuver that power cube over there. 4991 of the Red Alliance. Trying to pick up a power cube over on the Blue Alliance side. 1743 still trying to get the power cube in there, and they do. First power cube delivered into the vault for the Blue Alliance. 1743 still trying to get some power cubes over there. 45, 47, a little hung up on the scale right now. Blue Alliance, Blue Alliance is going to have some trouble with some penalties if they can't get out of there soon. 45, 47, still stuck up underneath the scale as head deputy referee Dante is giving them the count. Looks like 945 is over there trying to help them out. That looks like you heard is 30 seconds left. That's when you have to try to find. It's teamwork, and they finally break themselves free. But it cost them. They the lost the cube off the scale on that one. But we were entering into endgame with 10 seconds left. 49.91 already able to successfully do a climb. Red Alliance with one climb and the levitate bonus. That's two climbs in the bank right now. Let's see the results. The Red Alliance able to take the match on that one. Red Alliance 491, uh, Blue Alliance 184, Red Alliance able to pick up. So that's what the matches look like, and it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Um, we leave at 7 in the morning, we're back here about 7.30 or 8 o'clock each night. Um, it's long days for the kids, but it's exciting, it's a lot of fun. Um, and I, like, I, I think from like a teacher standpoint, it's really cool to see what the kids did, what was really neat to me was Mac Lear and some of the intermediate and primary teachers sending me pictures of their kids standing like this, watching the screen because it's broadcast and we send, we send the link to all the schools so that they can show it and just show the groups of kids standing around watching the matches through the day. That was kind of neat. That it's really across the whole school even though it's the high school kids that are doing that. You know? Yeah, I was say, well, I, brought, I brought my kids, I have three, to, to watch the the competition, not this year, but in previous years, and it's inspired them to get into the FLL. Oh, nice. So, you guys are the rock stars for the little kids. Um, <laughs> you might not think think so, but you're inspiring the next generation, so they look up to you, too. Yeah. So, great job. But if you guys have questions for them, um, <coughs> you know, if you don't have any questions, I'm sure they're, they just stand with the robot for you real quick. I would just like to say a couple things. First of all, thank you to the volunteers who help this program, teachers and, and parents and whoever's involved. The, uh, obviously, it takes guidance for the kids to be able to do what they've been doing. Um, you know, the introduction to robotics and teamwork and working within a structure like the guidelines you get from the program, um, the introduction to the engineering skills that it takes to be able to create the robot and be, be on the team and the computing skills. It's just remarkable to me that you guys have, have come this far in what you do. So I just, I'm, I'm so proud of you. And I, I know this board is too. I mean, you really represent Church's Valley extremely well. And we're so proud of you. And continue to do it and mentor the kids coming up. I love the, I love the junior <coughs> program. That is wonderful. Um, you know, I have a daughter who's an engineer. I say this every year, but I think of her when I watch you guys do this because she started, and this program didn't exist when she was a church in fact, but you guys have a huge head start, and it's, it's so great, um, especially seeing the gals out there in the crowd because women, we need more women in engineering in this world, so continue to, to, to be there and, and guys and girls work together and, and continue to do great things. It's, we're really, really proud of you. 
I didn't um, introduce Jonathan DeLong, um, Jeff Razanowski, and Lisa Razanowski, and Chad Warren, um, and there's a few other men. My daughter, Alex, is a, a mechanical engineer, and she mentors the team as well. Um, and there's a number of other people that aren't here tonight. Dane Bennington, um, that works for Argo um, with autonomous driving vehicles. Uh, he's an electrical engineer. Those people come and, and give their time for free and work with the kids and mentor them. So it's kind of a <coughs> up for them that they have real engineers or real workplace people to work with. And Jonathan was instrumental in getting a lot of machining done with our lift this year because some, we have some capabilities at the school, but we don't. We didn't have everything we needed, and he was able to take parts back to his shop based on drawings or designs, and be able to machine. And uh, Austin, his son, went in there and sent me pictures at two, three, four. I look in the timestamp: two, three, four in the morning, five <laughs> in the morning. And then I come into the robotics class, and Austin <coughs> passed out on the table in the classroom. <laughs> Austin, all right? And it's exhausted. Because he was up all night with his dad machining. Hey, I have to be good lines, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is real world. <laughs> you know, um, and, and Jeff and Lisa, like from a strategy standpoint, I don't think there's people that understand the game better than them. And there was more strategy in this game this year. It wasn't just putting pieces in to score points. There was time involved, there was how are you going to work with your other alliances and things. And um, he really works with the team on that and scouting. We have to scout all these other teams because of the finals and the way finals are selected. And he's able to pull together applications that the kids can use to put in information that compiles everything and we can scout and select alliances and things like that. So, um, and Chad's here all the time. All the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But I, they all put in their time because they enjoy it, um, you know. So I, did, I can't thank them enough for what they've done for us. And they're a huge asset to having the community involved with the team and being able to give them some professional insight. So thank you guys. I appreciate that. So you guys want to? Actually, I do. Oh, it's something. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, what's the significance of 4991? When you register your team, you get mm -hmm. uh, a number associated with it, that means that's the number in the sequence that you are, or 4,991. Um, they're in the 7,000s now since we've started. That's how fast FIRST is growing. Um, it's in 37 different countries right now. Um, when you go to World Championships, even at our regionals, we have teams from China that are with us. It's a huge language barrier sometimes. Last year, trying to help the Chinese team fix their broken robot, we were just putting <coughs> parts together and moving them and saying, like, this is what you need to do. My joke, because I talk loud whenever somebody is, doesn't understand me, I just start talking loud. They all laugh. You know? Um, I told a story about that. I had a student that didn't speak any English, a Chinese student, in class. And I started to talk louder, and, and the girl that was working with her said, Mr. Masick, she doesn't speak English. She's not deaf. <laughs> so, uh, but, it, you know, like kids learn how to work with the other teams, too, and help the other teams succeed. So that's what I like about it. It's, it's not like walking onto a football field where you're going there to annihilate the other team. Um, we're going there to, I mean, you, you obviously want to do well, represent well, and you want to win. But you also want to help build those other teams up, too. Because if they're not successful, they're not going to be around the next year. And then all those kids will lose. So. But so you guys want to? Um, oh. my, my quick question was so I know from January through March you were very busy. Um, what do you guys do for the balance of the year to stick together and keep working as a team? And you know? um, we don't. In the past years, we haven't typically done all the time because we're we are still a newer team and didn't know how to. But actually, now some of our mentors are planning to do like workshops because during the season we're busy. We don't have time to really teach some of the younger kids basic skills building and programming. So these workshops is where they can go and learn. And if you want to be on the team, you have to go to the workshop and learn. So we have people coming in that do have basic skills. Because a big problem with like the build team is certain kids won't know how to use a drill or certain things. Or won't know the certain tools. So it becomes a big struggle. But now we're planning workshops. Um, we have kids working on the FLA junior teams that are planning on helping. Um, some of us are just friends outside of this. So we kind of hang out together then. And we do have demos and things where we show off our robot and try to keep this going. That's awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, let us know how we can help you. Yeah. Okay.
We have that $38,000. We figure out how to fund every year. Um, do you guys want to turn the robot? While, while they're getting the robot all ready to go, um, Claire talked about robot demos. We call it community outreach. And that's. Did you have a question? No, I was going to ask Yeah, that's cool. Oh, you know what? I'm going to start showing you on yours. Okay. Um, but. Community outreach is what we call it. We'll go to Barnes & Noble for a weekend. <coughs> it was last year, but when we go there and we demo, parents from Upper St. Clair and Bethel Park, and, and they come and they see us and they talk to me about it and say, well, how, how can I get this in my school? Why don't we have this there? Um, I, I say, I don't know. Go back and ask, why isn't somebody doing it at your school? You know, I've talked to some of them. It's a big time commitment to, to make it happen. Um, and that's part of the issue, I think, with people. But um, part of it is, like, we've had support here. We've had the board support and um, administrator support, which really helps. It makes it easy for me to keep going. You know, I'm not, you're not fighting that and trying to keep this going at the same time. So we do appreciate the support we get from the board. That's been really awesome for us. And um, Dylan and Morgan are, they're our team drivers for this year. We do do driver tryouts too, so it just doesn't like Dylan gets to drive because he's a senior. Um, because honestly, he almost got beat out by Austin, um, who is a uh, great, great Austin. His, Austin is a sophomore this year. Yeah, and his, Austin's his first year on the team. He's never driven a robot before, but he almost became our team driver. So, you guys? I've driven it for you. Very, yeah. <laughs> I was on the job team last year. I was also <laughs> she was co-pilot last year also. <clears throat> so when they first turn it on, you hear that noise. That's the air compressor. As an onboard air compressor, it charges air tanks, so we have air throughout the match. You'll hear that, that run every once in a while as they use it up. Um, and then Dylan's going to kind of take it a little bit, drive it forward some. When that light's flashing, you know the robot's active. So I'm going to bring it, bring it over this way. In front of the mic there, so you have some space. Does anybody ever play a game where you have to drive towards yourself? <laughs> so, well, everything's backwards. Yeah. Well, that, these guys that drive, they can do it when that, that robot's running at its full speed. What's the speed? 12.2 12. 12. feet per second. 12. Uh, on the field, which is pretty quick. It's, it's about half of what our robot was last year because we didn't have room this year to go that fast. But so Dylan's going to take it through a little bit of exercise, like do a morning stretch. <laughs> That's all the different motions that the robot can do. You guys want to pick up a crate? Just use this as their scale, okay? It does have a camera built onto it also. And that camera was really used for when they were on the backside of game elements where the drivers couldn't see. And the camera shows on their dashboard so that they can see, be able to pick up. And bring it up and shoot it out on the table. So they have the ability to really pick and place accurately if they want. Or they can run the intake wheels and they can just shoot the cubes out if they're in a big hurry and not worried about stacking them up or anything.
celebrate CB too that you let the other kids and everybody drive the robot and teach them. I know that's stressful. <laughs> Especially since, I mean, you don't want you know anybody really touching your baby. Um, but uh, I thought that was successful. That was really neat. Yeah, I think we, I, I enjoy seeing the little, all the little kids learn to drive. But we do the Science Olympiad every year. We take the robotics team down. Actually, this year the robotics team is running the stations for the Science Olympiad. Um, they have 20 different stations down there. So the team will go down and run the stations. And then the drivers will work with the other kids that come into the gym for the Science Olympiad. And they get to play with some of the smaller VEX robots from the robotics class, as well as uh, drive the big robot and try some of those out. We have past year's robots because you can't really reuse. So we have $30,000 worth of robots right now. So a couple of them that one year we, I didn't like the robot at all. And it doesn't exist anymore. It's part, parts, are, parts of all different robots. So, um, but they'll uh, have three different robots down there at the uh, primary school for the Science Olympiad. So there's all kind of different robots for them to see and experience. Awesome. Yeah. Yes. Did you want to show them um, autonomous? Oh yeah, sure. I forgot about that. Yeah, you want to just bring it back that way? She wants to show you the autonomous program that she wrote in that last few hours that really helped us win the one match that we needed to. Outside of the frame of the robot, they're not allowed to be. Actually, they're not allowed to be outside the metal frame of the robot. So, if we go on the field and go to set up, this would be considered illegal. So the kids had to figure out a way to do this, and we struggled with it. We thought of um, pneumatically, could we put stops in and stuff like that? How can we do this? And what's interesting, Tanner Bach. Some of you may remember him. He was a student that graduated a few years ago. He was on our initial robotics team. Well, he came back and worked with us and worked with the build team a little bit. Some of our kids, a lot of the alumni come back. Dakota Roscoe has been back every year with us and helps. Tanner actually figured this out and said, why don't we try some little clips in here that are just spacers that hold them, that are on elastic straps. And it's something that simple from a different set of eyes that happened. He stopped in from work one night to see how we were doing. So what I'm doing is when we go on the field, actually we charge it in the pit with air. And then we set it up, and these little clips go in. Can't get it now. But in the pit, these clips go into place when we charge the, this up before we build it out to the field. And the clips go in. That keeps it all in there legal like that. And then the first move in autonomous is those arms will collapse in, and it releases those little clips, and then we're free to do whatever we want. So it was really that simple. So this autonomous program, what we needed to be able to do, the, the other alliances could do certain things in autonomous, but they needed somebody to be able to drive forward, lift the crate, and drop it in the switch, the lower of those two balances. And we didn't have an autonomous program to do that. So Dakota Roscoe worked with Morgan, and Morgan learned more, I think, in that stretch of time in autonomous programming and how to, how to make it work and figuring out how long does it need to run to lift that high and all that kind of stuff. And um, Dakota fell out of his chair when it happened. We were all in the stands waiting for this thing, and Dakota <laughs> fell on the floor. He was so excited. <laughs> Everyone was cheering because actually it's awesome. So. Is that straight? I don't know how far it is. I don't know you can check it. Let's, let me just pull it. Oh. Just give you a little bit of extra space. Because it's set to go, you know that autonomous line? It's set to go just beyond that line. It really goes right up to the side of the... It just goes up to the side of that switch. And it'll elevate and then drop that in there. So this, nobody's controlling it. It's all computer programming. So it was able to slam that crate down into that switch, which tips the switch our direction and gives us control of it in autonomous, which was ranking points and a lot of extra points for that. So. 
Anybody have any questions? Thank you, guys, for the time. I appreciate it. is the motion to approve the nominee for our William L. Cooper as our school board trustee for the Western <coughs> Region. Um, has everybody had a chance to review <coughs> Mr. Cooper? Yeah, for the health consortium. Um, was that the only name? That was the only name presented, yes. Okay. Yeah. So he's one, uh, I guess he's one by default for our district. <laughs> but, uh, he's, from what I understand, yeah, he's, the uh, vice, he's the vice president of um, Pathfinder. On the board of Pathfinder. Well, he's a great guy. Yeah, I've actually known him. Nice he taught at Carrick High School in English when I was there. So uh, <laughs> I've known him since high school. Nice. Right, he's a great guy. Good. Yeah, he definitely gets our support. Okay. Um, I'd like to get a motion to approve these uh, items. I get a motion to approve items 3.1 through 3.5. First by Ms. Murphy. Second. Second by Mr. Kramer. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Okay, on to our action and discussion items. Mr. Jason Day is out there waiting patiently to present his construction report. I enjoyed that thoroughly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I told him he had to wait this year because we had to go after him last year. <laughs> 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 oh, that, that, was, that was great. Hey, and, that. and congratulations to these students. That was great. Well worth the time. Trying to figure out how to use that on site, right? Yeah, yeah, materials. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and a little check will help us do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thirty eight grand. PJ has to be afraid of the wood. All the past that was the latter on. Yeah, that's right. The golden green title would look great on that bag. Yes, it would. So actually, before I get started, one of the things I, I did have a question. Because I have no idea if Mars Area School District has something like that. Do you, what surrounding schools do you guys Mars 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 which operates out of CMU, um, that, it, but it's just solely gro all girls. Yeah. Well, like Canamac, Mount Lebanon, none of those local schools have one. We're the only one out this way. But I know. Okay. Well, um, the construction really more the same from last Wednesday's phone call. If you were on it, um, I handed out my executive summary highlights. So really the RightCon updated their schedule and we got some feedback from some of the prime contractors so we're adjusting that somewhat. Um, the middle school, as we all know, it's been fully occupied and completed. The punch list really inside is, is dwindling down so that process is going well. Um, the balancing and the commissioning is probably the next big step to really um, finish and get wrapped up in the next couple months. So HF Lens is spearheading that operation with the uh, MEP guys uh, to get that taken care of. Um, the high school? Question, Go ahead. What does IGM to punch out mean? They actually still need to come create the list for the gym uh, and the stage. They have not done that yet. Um, Muchi and some of the other trades have performed a self-punch list. 
So we anticipate their list to not be that long when they come do that. Is there a deadline for that? Uh, we would like to get it done as soon as possible. So I think ICAM has it scheduled for the next week or two. Um, the kitchen, their punch list is really complete. Uh, there's a couple of warranty items now that we're kind of transitioning into that phase. Um, so we'll probably end up closing that prime contractor out within the next couple of months. He'd probably be the first contractor that we'll close out completely. Uh, the high school side, uh, the same for the performing arts and the tech ed. The punch list is dwindling down. Um, phase 2A, clearly the big thing that's going on there. A lot of activity has really started. Um, as we talked before, the slab on deck pours and the steel are done. Uh, so we're getting into framework, rough in. Um, we've had a ton of deliveries the last couple days. Um, haven't heard any complaints from the principals about blocking traffic, so I guess that is good, but it's been busy out front there. Um, Ductwork's being delivered, a ton of metal studs for the exterior walls and interior walls. Um, so I, I would anticipate really within the next week or two, if that workforce isn't up to 80 men or more, I'd be surprised. So it's, it's going to get busy, which is, which is good. Um, <clears throat> the fireproofing's ongoing and down to the second floor now, uh, so then they'll jump up to the fourth floor later next week. Roofers on site, I'd say, were 100% dried in for the roof. Um, they have to finish um, doing some detailing and in the insulation and permanent roof very on about half the building. <coughs> so all is going forward with that phase as it's planned. Um, really at this point I have no change orders tonight for you. Um, our contingency percentage has been floating around the same percentage there for a month or two with what I foresee as some risk assessment and some changes that are out there. So that's generally what I had tonight. Uh, pretty brief, unless there's any questions or comments. From I want to switch back to the How does it range down in the back when you have a shop? It's uh, better now if they frame it all in. I think it still needs. Jake, I don't know, like that one window by the, between the man door and the garage, I just don't need sill it. Yeah, there's some minor things, but it's okay, a bit more better. Yeah. I mean, when you say you get that all fixed up, because I don't like that drainage situation. Yeah. You guys would be gone. And they installed that um, rubber threshold, which I think has helped somewhat yeah. over there, but there's a corner. I know where he's talking. Thank you. They're not shy to get a hold of me, so we've been over there quite a bit to help. Yeah, I'm not shy at you. No. <laughs> and you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. <laughs> That's why we're here. Thank you. Chase, could you talk about the uh, movement of the hoops in the, in the new middle school gym? Um, we, we talked about that early on, but we weren't sure who was going to accept responsibility for that. Has that been resolved? Uh, not yet. Um, Nucci has submitted a cost for that, so that'll be part of our final reconciliation with them. Um, our position is it's not your problem, that it's, that it's theirs. Uh, so that'll be the basis of the discussion when we have that meeting. Okay, good. Just a comment, you know, when I, when I look at our dashboard. Yes. It's very impressive when I look at the, you know, the column with all the duns noted. So, um, you know, just, you know, so far very well executed project from the looks of the dashboard and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and you're welcome. I, like I said, it's been a great team, and you guys have been cooperative all the way down to staff and students to make it successful. So, uh, almost two years in, believe it or not. Yeah. Looking for that high school learning power. That's the next big one. That's the next big one. So, for those of <laughs> you who don't recall, that, that addition has to be ready for this Christmas of 18 to move into for your January 19th. And we only lose one temporary hallway in that. Correct. Correct. You so will still be two. There will still be two temporary hallways. <laughs> yeah. Because once the uh, high school administration wing is completed, that's when those tunnels will go away. 
Right. You yeah, you'll lose from the performing arts to the high school. Academy. You'll lose the tunnel by the cafeteria and the tech area. Right. Okay. So. I know this winter's been nothing like, and spring has been nothing like last year's. So schedule wise, we still doing well? Yeah, we're still right around where we, right Con projected it. Um, the roofer actually has been battling the weather and he's gotten enough dry in, which has helped most importantly for the fireproofing because um, that has to be dry. And you can clearly see that he tented the entire building in, um, which has helped him pour those slabs that are done and the fireproofing, which because you need the, the warmth for that. So. Great. One other question, Jason. So we, we received a couple sizable credits, one from HF Lens and, and a couple others that we were, we were due. Those are going, where are those ending up at? Are they going back into the budget number? Are they going into contingency? Where are they ending up at? I would think they would go back to your soft costs. Okay. So that's in the budget. Yeah. So that shouldn't affect the contingency. So that, those, those dollars are going back in the budget. Yeah, because that's the building performance architecture and HF Lens. Uh, Prasina has a line item in your soft cost for that. Okay. So that's where that would go. Right. Um, some of the, clearly the construction credits are still within my pending value that you see in the report I gave you. Okay. Good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. For Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I need a motion to approve. Mr. Day's construction report. So moved. Second. Mr. Kaczynski, second by Mr. Kearney. All in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. This is a, uh, I need a motion to approve the March payout summary. Does everybody have any questions or comments regarding the March payouts? Can I get a motion to approve it? So moved. Mr. Kaczynski, Mr. Kramer, second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. Okay, that's all we have on our agenda, other than I would like to open the audience up again for public comment, if anybody would like to step up and make a comment. Before we close, I would like to recognize uh, the loss of one of our CV longtime teachers and community members who, who served uh, at the Scott Township Pole for many, many years and, and served within the district. Mr. Ron Ellis passed. And, so just to recognize him and his service over the years, I, I just wanted to take this wonderful man. Yes. It's a good man, a good uh, uh, a loss for the community. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But God rest his soul. Okay, could I get a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Let's keep a second by Mr. Cora. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <coughs> Thank you for all being here.